Hi, my name is Paddy Hirsch. I'm a senior editor at Marketplace. Today I want to talk about the repo market. Firstly, because the government's considering making some changes to the way the repo market works, or certain parts of it. And secondly, because a lot of people don't understand how the repo market works or uh, why it's so important. So let's see if we can explain it. Here we go. Repo does not stand for repossession. It actually stands for repurchase, and uh, that'll become clear why in a second. Now, the repo market is the place where banks who need money go to get money, or at least it's one of the places. There are several like commercial paper market, but the repo market is a very popular one because money in it is cheap. Now, most repo loans are made overnight. And when I say loans, they're kind of like loans with a twist, which I'll explain in a second. Now, most of these loans are made overnight. Longer term loans are called term repos, but we're not going to deal with those right now. We'll just deal with the overnight loans. So uh, who uses it and how does it work? Well, let's take an analogy. Let's use uh, a borrower. We'll call him Sam. There he is. Now, uh, Sam uh, has got a truck that is f empty of all gas, and he needs to fill it because he needs to get to work. Now, he's got a problem because he's absolutely skinned. He's got no cash. His credit card is drained. He's got no money at all. And in order to get money, at work, he needs to be able to get to work, so he needs to be able to get money, a short-term loan, to fill his car up to get himself to work. So he gets in his Rolodex, and he calls around and sees who he can find, and he manages to find Amy. Amy's a nice girl. She's got a pot of cash, and she is willing to lend, or she's willing to hand over $100 to Sam. But there's a condition. She wants collateral. Now, most loans obviously have collateral. But in the repo market, in this system, uh, the collateral is used somewhat differently. So Amy goes to Sam's place, looks around, and says, uh, what have you got? I can use this collateral. She's on a box of ACDC records, okay? all the vinyl up till 1990. She says, I'll be able to sell this for $100 if it all goes wrong, so we'll use this. So here we are, this box of ACDC records. <laughs> okay. She says, okay, Sam, what I want you to do is I want you to sell me Okay, I want you to sell me those records. So S Sam is actually selling the records for $100. So Amy hands over 100 bucks. Sam hands over the ACDC records. And Amy now owns those records. Now in this deal, uh, two things are happening. Firstly, Amy is taking possession, okay, legal possession of the collateral, if you like. And secondly, she is uh, saying that part of the agreement is that Sam will repurchase these records, who repurchase the collateral the next day, hence the repo loan. So it's kind of like a loan, okay, but it's also not a loan because she's actually bought it. It's a transaction. So, but he's agreeing to repurchase this the next day. And in exchange for setting up this agreement, Amy wants a fee, usually a very small fee, say, call it a dollar. So he hands over the records. She hands over $100. Sam goes to work. He works hard. He gets all his tips, makes lots of money, comes back the next day. And what does he do? He repurchases his ACDC records. So they go back, and Sam hands over $101. Okay, there we are. Everyone's happy. And that is the, s the essence of the repo market. That's the essence of the repo loan. Okay, so who are these people in the real world, and, and how does this work? Well, the borrower is a bank, a bank that needs money quickly. If you think about an investment bank, investment bank doesn't do what a commercial bank does, which is, you know, make... Uh, uh, take deposits and make loans. It does investment banking business, which is, you know, kind of, it uh, puts together bond deals and does M&A deals and this kind of stuff. So it makes lots of money, but it doesn't do it in the way a commercial bank does. And sometimes, it in fact, always, it needs money to fund its operations before that other money comes in to, to pay these loans back. So what it does, it, it gets overnight money from the repo market. So it goes out and it looks for a commercial bank uh, who's got lots of money lying around, presumably, because they're taking deposits and making loans like regular banks do, and uh, the commercial bank can lend that money out or can put that money into the repo system. Now, when a commercial bank... Uh, so, so what about these ACDC records, this collateral? Well, usually it's securities, and usually it's the safest type of securities because, obviously, the... Uh, the commercial bank who's doing this lending, who's, into, who's getting involved in this deal, wants to make sure that it's got uh, something that it can sell easily. And commercial, and uh, sorry, treasury securities are very liquid and very safe. So that's that used to be the central part of the uh, the central demand for collateral in the repo market. But recently, uh, banks have started to use more and more other types of securities. And uh, in the bad old days, uh, before the crash happened. A lot of those securities were asset-backed securities and mortgage-backed securities, so, you know, and CDOs. And uh, the uh, the quality of these securities got more and more risky. More about that in a second. Okay, so that's the essential way this works. It's an investment bank or a bank that uh, needs overnight money in order to fund its operations. Goes to a bank that's got some money lying around, surrenders some collateral, and they get involved in this deal. Okay, that's the basic market. Now the government's worried about another s type of repo, which is called a tri-party repo. Tri-party because three people are involved. Okay. You've got the bar, uh, you've got the uh, 
you've got the, the, the borrower, you've got the lender, and the third party is the, an intermediary, which is called a clearing bank, okay? The clearing bank. So in, in this situation, we'll call our clearing bank, our intermediary, we'll call him Jim. All right, there he is. Jim's a bit, there's, this dark, there's dark glasses there. Anyway, Jim is the intermediary. So why would you want to use an intermediary? Well, if you're a commercial bank, you, it's, it's kind of a pain you know, to put this whole deal together. You've got to decide what the collateral is going to be. You've got to work out the deals of the loan. You've got to determine you know, the creditworthiness of the borrower, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of these people use these clearing banks, these intermediaries, to make the deal go more easily. Obviously, the clearing bank takes up a, a little fee and so lops off um, the, the lender's fee slightly, but uh, that's th they use it because it's convenient. Now in the US, the clearing banks, the two big clearing banks are JP Morgan and uh, Bank of New York Mellon. They're the two biggest ones and they do the majority of the business. But those banks sound like regular banks, right? They, and they do have regular banking business. And the government is worried that they, um, because the other banks on either side of this trade are competitors and therefore there's a conflict of interest there. And you know, they might demand too much collateral or they might hurt um, one of their competitors by, uh, you know, putting onerous demands on them. So the government is considering, only considering, replacing the clearing bank system with a kind of a, a government utility, if you like, a utility bank um, that, uh, that, that would be a government entity. So there's some talk about that, and, and that's why, uh, that, that's, that's the reason for, for that conversation, is because of that conflict of interest. So what can go wrong in this system? And, uh, and, and why is it so, why are we hearing so much about it right now? And why is the government considering these changes? or focusing on it? Well, the reason is because of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. These are two investment banks that needed this money desperately to, to fund their operations. Every, every night they needed this money to keep themselves moving. And in fact, investment banks still uh, need this short-term money to operate. And their survival depended on their reputation. Because if you don't have a repu good reputation, nobody's going to lend to you, right? So people were looking at Bear Stearns and looking at Lehman Brothers, and they were saying, hang on a second, well, firstly, what was this collateral that you're surrendering? All these mortgage-backed securities, all these CDOs. Not sure we like the look of that. And then we look at you, and we think, well, if that's the collateral you're surrendering, or that's the collateral you're using, what does that say about the state of your own ability to operate? So firstly, am I going to accept this collateral because I don't know if I'm going to be able to sell it, given the fact that it's plunging in the market right now? And secondly, I'm not even sure that you're going to be able to be because of the, the type of m businesses that you're investing in, I'm not sure you're going to be good for the money the next day. So suddenly all these banks started to back away from Bear Stearns and eventually Lehman Brothers as well. They stepped back. And what does that do to you if you're an investment bank and you need that money to operate overnight? Well, if more and more people back away, suddenly there's nobody on the other side of this trade. You're stuck with money owed. You've got to pay people. You've got to operate. But nobody's going to lend to you overnight. Well, that is going to leave you very badly needing a drink.